How's everyone doing? Hope everyone's doing well. I think I have it set so that folks joining are automatically muted, um, just so we can um, keep up with the background um, noise, keep that down as we, as we go through this. Um, we're gonna give a little bit of time to make sure everyone can join. And in case you are experienced with Zoom, could someone just um, make a quick note in the chat that you can hear me all right, just because everyone is muted, or give me a thumbs up if your video is on. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> Let's make sure we got everyone in here. Like I said, we're gonna give a little bit of time to make sure everyone is in. I cannot see my computer screen with my sunglasses on. We got a good amount of folks here. It's a beautiful day. I'm not sure if anyone's gotten a chance to be outside yet, but it is gorgeous out today. Um, and I'll say this again once everyone's here, but we're actually going to do um, the first part of this, kind of a shorter um, first part of this workshop outside, just so you can see what our chicken setup looks like here at the farm. Um, and then I'm actually going to pause the video, head into the office, because I have a bunch of pictures and diagrams to show you. Um, it'll be a little more helpful as we're kind of going through the different topics here. Um, and I'm going to put my volume up pretty high here so I can hear if someone else jumps into the waiting room. Um, but I think we are going to start. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Corey Thomas. I am the Education Director with Masaro Community Farm. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this workshop is going to cover everything about backyard chickens. Um, and hopefully, uh, once I kind of get through some of the main topics, we can um, have a big Q&A session, ask as many questions as you'd like. Um, just some quick background about my own experience with poultry. Um, I have raised chickens for at least 13, 14 years. Um, I had them when I was younger, um, all through high school, college. Um, so I've had chickens. I've worked with flocks as small as three chickens and as large as 300 chickens. Um, so I've had a lot of experience with chickens. Um, they are the gateway barn animal. Um, they're the gateway farm animal. Normally folks who get chickens, it doesn't take long before you're like, you know, I, I think I could cover goats. I think I've got that. So uh, you're, you're warned now. Um, so what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna adjust the camera here and I'm gonna show you our setup that we have here for our chickens, um, talk a bit about that. And like I said, we're gonna move inside. Um, in case you're new to using Zoom, um, there are some different views. Um, something you're gonna to wanna to use is speaker view, um, which should be in the upper right hand corner of your screen um, or speaker view, gallery view, let's see here. What do I have here? I want speaker view or gallery view. Um, as long as you can see me, you're in good shape. Um, there's also a chat function, which we'll use later um, for the um, Q&A, any questions you might have. Um, and if you don't wanna forget a question, feel free to ask it now in the chat kind of as we go. Um, it might get answered over the course of the workshop. Um, but uh, if not, we'll, we'll take some time after towards the end. Um, so let me adjust the mic here or the mic or the camera, I should say, to make sure you can see. Can you see our chickens? You can see our chickens. Excellent. You can probably hear them already. Um, I'm gonna open them up. Uh, they're gonna be very excited. This is our ramp, just so they can get in and out of the coop. All right. Morning, everyone. What are you doing? Okay. Just heard one more person enter the waiting room. There we are. One more in the waiting room. So these are our chickens. Um, let's see if I can angle the camera here just to show you our setup. 
Um, so our chicken coop is set up, we have a ramp that leads up into the main part of the coop. Our chicken coop is up and off the ground, um, which is really convenient. It kind of keeps smaller pests like mice and rats out of the coop. Um, and also it makes cleaning easier. You can kind of rake out whatever waste you have kind of at waist level into a wheelbarrow, something like that. So having it up off the ground when you um, have a chicken coop is really nice. Um, so as you can see inside, we also have some nest boxes. Um, you're going to get a closer look at those later in some of the diagrams I have, um, just to show you um, what those are entailed for and um, <clears throat> how many to have and all those details there. Let's see if I can turn you a little bit. So um, <clears throat> we have their water set up back there. Um, it's a gravity fed water system. Um, and then we also have their feeder here. Um, their feeder is designed to be pest proof. Um, and let me show you what that looks like. Excuse me, ladies. All right. Um, so this feeder here is designed so that they actually have to step down on this plate before the feeder opens up. Um, it keeps birds from getting into the feed. Um, it keeps most larger pests from getting in as well. Um, however, we do have a very intelligent raccoon um, that has figured out how to actually bend the metal sides of it. Um, so we'll get more into that uh, later, kind of keeping pests out of your feed and out of your coop um, and things like that as we go. So I just want to get a chance to to quickly show you what our coop looks like here and our setup for the chickens. If you've been to the farm before, you've seen that we have, uh, I don't know, five foot fencing around the coop. Um, we'll talk a bit more about fencing and things like that as we go. Um, so I am going to pause my video and I am going to head inside um, to get the rest of the presentation together. So just sit tight, shouldn't take more than a minute, um, and we will resume shortly. All right, and I'm back. Um, so if you are just joining us, I know I had a couple uh, couple folks join the waiting room. Um, all you missed is that I um, took a chance to take a look at our coop that we have here at Masaro Farm. Um, if you missed out on that, this session is being recorded. Um, so you will all get the link to the full video afterwards in case you want to see what that coop looks like. Um, don't worry, you didn't miss too much. I have lots of diagrams, things like that to show you about other coops. Um, so, um, I'm gonna, if I, if I start speaking too quickly or if I'm jumping around too much, feel free to add to the chat and just, you know, ask me to go back, cover certain things. Um, so in case you missed it, my name is Corey. I'm the education director for Sorrow Farm. Um, I've raised chickens for years. Um, I've worked with really small flocks, um, larger flocks of chickens, up to 300, um, at some of the larger farms I've worked for. Um, 
in a variety of different setups. Um, and that's something that's really great about raising chickens is that um, the setup you have to care for them can be pretty flexible, um, which can sometimes cause confusion, but also allows for more creativity in terms of how you'd like to um, raise chickens. Um, so in that chat function, I'd love for folks to just add in, I see we do have one question already, which is great. Um, if you can open up that chat bar and just let me know um, either if you already have chickens, looking to get chickens, um, you know, if you already have a small flock, already have a large flock, you maybe just put an order in for some chicks. Um, I'd love to kind of get some background just to make sure we cover those things as we go. So feel free to kind of put in that chat kind of what your level of interest is, whether you just want it here to learn um, or you're really looking to get started and looking for more information as we go. And so I'll kind of keep an eye on that as we jump through here. Um, so why do we want chickens? Um, well, chickens are awesome for starters. Um, and you may, uh, some folks are really interested in chickens more recently because of the um, concerns that folks are having with their food system and where food is coming from um, and the limitations we're starting to see on some of our foods in the grocery stores. So I know, for example, um, a lot of the major hatcheries, and we'll talk about those a little bit later, um, a lot of the major hatcheries are completely sold out um, of chicks and they're to the point where they're already taking orders for uh, late summer and fall. Um, so chickens are on the rise, folks are interested in them, which is great um, because I think that the more we get folks that are able to um, you know, source more of their food from their backyard, that's always a great thing. Um, so uh, let's jump right in. You either are gonna have chickens um, because you're interested in getting fresh eggs. Some folks are raising chickens for the meat as well. I feel like most folks are interested in raising chickens for the eggs. So we'll kind of stick to those topics for the most part. Um, but if you are curious about kind of the meat production of chickens, um, feel free to add that in the questions as well. Um, so let's jump into it. I have some photos here um, to kind of talk about this. Let's see if I can share my screen. Share screen. Uh, yes. Excellent. Can everyone see that okay? The picture of the photos? Can someone just give me a thumbs up if you can see the chickens there? Is that showing up properly? Excellent. Thank you. Um, so as you can see, we have a lot of different chicken breeds. Um, there are so many choices as to what you're looking for, whether you're looking for um, a white egg layer, a brown egg layer, a more docile chicken, a more, um, should we say, a showy chicken, um, like kind of like the Polish one that's down there, kind of towards the middle, um, kind of like Afro chicken, so to speak. Um, so there's lots of different choices for what kinds of breeds to get. Um, and just make sure you do your research. Um, different breeds have different qualities, things you might be looking for um, as you shop. And there are a lot of breeds that have been developed over time. Um, chickens have, were originally derived from actually um, wild uh, birds in Indonesia. That's where chickens were domesticated and they eventually spread throughout the rest of the world. Um, so we've reached this point where there are a lot of different breeds um, and I'm gonna point out some of the more important ones. Um, or not necessarily more important, but um, sort of ideal for New England climate um, as we go. So let's see here. I wanted to uh, discuss sort of the, um, let's see, can I go through here? Next, yes, there we go. So as you can see, there are a lot of different um, egg colors that you can get from different chickens. Um, so there are white egg layers, there are brown egg layers, and you even have the blue and green egg layers. Those are gonna come from uh, Americana chickens. Um, which are a breed of chicken that was developed in South America. Um, and what's really neat about the Americanas is that there's no standard um, color or feather pattern. Um, so what's really exciting is if folks usually order chicks um, and you're kind of looking at the pictures of what well, you know, different chicks look like, um, whatever you can't identify, if you order Americanas, it's gonna be Americanas just because they all look so variable. Um, so there are a lot of different egg colors you can have. Um, I'm going to quickly jump into the chat here um, just to make sure we're covering some things either. And I do want to kind of understand where we're all coming from in terms of our interest in chickens. Some folks have had chickens. Awesome. 
folks have them currently, here to learn, had some previously, looking to learn. Wyatt, awesome job thinking about the bees. That's really exciting too. Um, just a quick note, if you are interested in learning about beekeeping for our audience, um, we do have beekeeping lectures as well. Um, keep up on our social media, you can see our uh, schedule there. Um, Tom, you're under the gun, huh? You ordered the chicks and gotta make a coop. Well, we're gonna talk about that. Um, that's excellent. Um, excellent, okay, so we're looking at some, some interest in chickens, some interest in building a coop. Um, this is great. Okay, so I do want to show you some photos I pulled up of um, different types of coops, so we can kind of talk about the different um, designs. And because keeping chickens can be so variable, there are a lot of different designs. So I kind of pulled up some photos here of some different designs you can have for a chicken coop. Um, and there are some common features that are great if you are looking to have a chicken coop. Um, as you can see, most of these are up off the ground. Um, as I mentioned with our coop we have out at the farm here, up off the ground is great because you're less likely to have issues with pests. Um, most of the lumber is going to be up off the ground, which is going to prevent rot. Um, and also it makes cleaning easier. Um, having enough space to kind of fit a wheelbarrow under the door to scrape out all the shaving, things like that, is going to be ideal. Um, so more spacious is great. Um, having space to clean out the coop is a great idea. Um, for example, you see this one in the upper left-hand corner, the white coop here. Um, I worked at a farm that had one just like this, except it wasn't off the ground. It was sitting on the ground, um, which wasn't horrible. Um, but what happened was when you opened that door, it was really challenging to reach all the way inside to clean out all of the shavings. Um, and so you actually had to climb inside of it to clean it out, um, which was not ideal. Um, so ideally, uh, it's nice to have a coop that is up off the ground and also has a footprint. If it's a small coop, has a small enough footprint, you can reach inside of the rake and pull out all the shavings or large enough that you can um, adequately stand inside of that coop to clean it out without, you know, hunching over and just having horrible posture the whole time you're cleaning out your coop. Um, so you either want small and easy to reach all the corners, or let's say you're going big, you want 100 chickens, which go for it, I think that's great. Um, make sure you have enough space to be able to get into that coop and clean it out properly. You want your chicken coop design to be convenient for you and easy to clean and very user friendly. Um, now, uh, the amount of space your chicken coop has is going to vary depending on how many uh, chickens you have. Um, we're going to get into roost space and things like that, but essentially what I tell folks is that if you have a small amount of chickens, they aren't creating a ton of body heat. So you want a smaller coop so that that coop holds their body heat and keeps them warm in the winter time. Um, if you have a lot of chickens, you're going to need a larger coop. Um, and that's okay, but that's going to have all their body heat there. So essentially what I'm getting at is you don't want to construct a massive coop and then only keep three chickens inside um, because th that body heat is going to dissipate really quickly in the coop um, and you're going to have to make sure that you have a heat lamp installed for your chickens and we'll get into that the heat lamp aspect more down the line. Um, and make sure access to the eggs is pretty easy. So you can see on most of these designs, these photos that I have here, um, for example, on the white coop, there's a little uh, hinged door on the side to access the eggs. Um, that top middle photo, um, that's called an egg loo. That's a commercially available design. You can see there's a little door on the side there to reach the eggs. Um, like I said, it's about convenience. I want to make sure that you can reach the eggs really easily. Um, you can clean it very easily. Um, and making things that are um, pest proof, um, which we're gonna cover. Um, so if you're designing your own coop, those are things you wanna have in mind. If you're ordering a coop, um, there are a lot of prefabricated designs that are available, um, but you do want to make sure that they're durable. Um, for example, the bottom right-hand corner, um, I don't recall what the company is that makes that style, but they make rabbit hutches, they make chicken coops, and you'll see similar designs if you go to a hardware store um, tractor supply, I'm pretty sure carries those. They are not that durable. So I would avoid that design if you can, that bottom right. Um, avoid purchasing a kit. 
um, when building a chicken coop um, because they usually aren't that sturdy um, and they're not going to last that long. Uh, if you're in a pinch and you know you just have to make it work, that's okay. But ideally, you'd either like to try to either a build your own, um, and they don't have to be fancy. Um, the chickens aren't going to notice if they uh, aren't fancy looking. Um, or you can hire someone to build a small one for you. Or you can buy a prefabricated one that is pre-built um, and sturdy. Actually, like the, in the top two corners, uh, it's actually you can see it's about the same design. Um, there are ones that they sell that are prefabricated that are solid, sturdy material. Um, you just don't. You just want to try to avoid the smaller kits because they won't last that long um, and they won't hold up to the elements. Um, so that's what you want to avoid. Um, all right, I want to talk about coop requirements, but I want to jump into the chat real quick here to make sure um, if you don't have any questions. Oh, lost the audio. Is everyone hearing me okay now? It sounds like it's in. All right, I'm getting a thumbs up. Make sure the audio is good. Okay, all right, let me know if that goes out again. Um, not sure what would be causing that, but um, I'll keep an eye on that. Um, um, what's considered small amount of chickens? Well, it depends on how many chickens you want. Um, so there is a square footage um, that is designated by like US poultry producers. Um, and it kind of gets down to a matter of how much space you want your chickens to have. Um, there's certainly a limit of too little space. Um, so just for example, if I'm remembering correctly, US poultry production, they set their standard at two two square feet per chicken, um, which is a small amount of floor space. Um, but keep in mind, you're most likely going to be constructing an outdoor run for your chickens as well, an outdoor space. So if you have a small coop, um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. As long as you have enough um, nest boxes, and we'll talk about how many you need there, um, and you have the right amount of roost space, um, having a small amount of floor space um, isn't a bad thing. So Lisa, I thought it was four square feet inside, 10 outside. So there are different guidelines depending on um, who you ask, essentially. Um, and two square feet, certainly, I think is pretty small. Um, but if you have a large outdoor run space for them, then having that smaller indoor space isn't as much of a concern as long as they have the um, nest boxes that they need and the roost bars that they need to sleep at night. Um, so four square feet inside, 10 outside, that's certainly a good metric as well. That's a little more space for them. Um, and probably would result in fewer cleanings because they have more space. Um, so you will see varying answers on that, um, but I'm gonna get into some of the metrics um, farther down. So um, in terms of making sure your coop is the right temperature, um, you're gonna wonder, okay, do I need a heat lamp? And essentially that narrows down to how many chickens you have. Um, if you have a really small coop, um, and all of your chickens are on that roost bar together all lined up and they're huddled up and your coop is really well insulated, you may not need a heat lamp for your chickens. Um, but if you have a large chicken coop, maybe you um, got it from a friend or you, you're repurposing a shed and you have a small amount of chickens, maybe four or five in this massive shed, you are gonna want a heat lamp because that heat that the chickens generate at night isn't gonna be enough to warm up the whole coop. Um, and another question is, will you need fans in the summertime? And that depends. If you have enough outdoor space for them, um, and if you have windows in your coop that have screens, um, you may not need a fan. Um, I haven't seen issues with chickens overheating too much. I saw it once, and the issue was the chicken coop um, didn't really have great ventilation. There were a couple windows, but they were very small. Um, and the chickens were, they, they will pant. Um, and seeing panting chickens isn't a concern. They will do that naturally in the summertime um, or if they're stressed out, good to know if you're dealing with your chickens and they're, they just start panting. Um, but you wanna make sure you have good cross breeds, good ventilation in your coop to make sure that they don't um, have an issue with overheating. And if that's something you can't avoid, then you could consider putting a fan in, um, even a simple box fan, just something that, you know, they can't hurt themselves if they were to bump up into it. Um, I have a question here. Since older chickens stop laying eggs, how many do you need to accommodate to have three laying hens and the non-laying hens? Um, do you mean uh, nest boxes? Oh, 
how many um, how many chickens? Here, I'll wait for you to follow up there. Um, kind of three laying hens and the non-laying ones. How many nest boxes or roost space? Um, I can see you typing. <laughs> oh, and someone else is jumping in here. Here, I'll wait for your answer there. I'm going to keep jumping ahead here. Um, where did I leave off? So fans, heat lamps. So roost bars and nest boxes. Let's talk about that. So roost bars are the spaces where your chickens are sleeping and nest boxes are the spaces where your chickens are laying their eggs. Um, here we go. How many chickens will you have in total if you have three laying and the older ones? Um, oh, like, so, um, how many chickens have if three laying hens, the older ones? If you have three, it depends on how many older chickens you would have. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I understand your question. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, but yeah, so I mean, the chickens we have here, I'm sorry, we have 12, I believe, maybe a little less than that, maybe 10. Um, and they're all active layers. So um, we let's, uh, I'll circle back to the older laying hens as well. Um, so where was I? Roost bars and nest boxes. Um, so nest boxes are pretty easy to construct. You can use plywood for them. Um, you just want to make sure a good guideline is about um, a foot by a foot by a foot. Um, and you can leave the top of the box open when you construct it in your coop. Um, you can leave it closed off in case you have multiple stacked on top. Um, and I do have a photo of that. Let me track that down. Um, and roost bars are the spaces where your chickens will sleep at night. Um, chickens, uh, almost like a bird on a telephone wire, they will sleep um, with their toes curled up on a bar. And I have some excellent photos. Um, they're a little blurry, um, but these are roost bars. Um, so this is actually a really cool design for a roost bar. You can see they have these um, kind of uh, little sticks of wood set up there so that the chickens can climb up the side, which is great. You don't necessarily need that. Um, let's say you didn't have that and you just had a two by four running diagonally up the side. Um, the chickens will just jump from one roost bar up to the other. Um, but what is really important about roost bars is that they are staggered diagonally. Um, if you were to have them be just horizontally, um, you aren't making use of the coop space um, as well as you could be. But if you have them vertically, you will have chickens pooping on each other and no one needs that. So if you have them diagonally, you're kind of um, optimizing the space you have in your coop, um, but you're also giving the chickens enough space. And when you're doing out the math of how large to make your um, roost bars, you want to give your chickens between eight inches and a foot of space per chicken on a roost bar. Um, so uh, let's say I have three chickens. I want to make sure I have at least 24 inches of a roost bar. Um, I usually err on the side of fewer ro uh, roost bar space um, per chicken, just because you'll see when they go to bed at night, um, especially in the winter time, they will huddle up right next to each other. They will make really good use of that space. Um, so for example, in this photo here, this is probably at least, what, 15 feet of roost space. Um, that's a huge amount of space that could accommodate a really large uh, amount of chickens. Um, that, you know, this coop looks like it's for a large amount of chickens. Um, but let's say you only had 10 birds. I guarantee you, if you opened up this coop in the winter time, you would see all 10 birds on one of these roost bars um, because they like to stay warm um, and they'll, they'll huddle for that warmth. Um, you can see in this coop, they do have a heat lamp shining down on the roost bars, which is awesome. They have a uh, feeder and water inside the coop. Um, I have mixed feelings on that. I think you could put feed inside the coop or outside the coop. Same thing for water. Um, in general, I usually like to keep the water outside the coop just because it's a little neater. Um, if it spills, it's not a big deal if it spills into the grass um, or the dirt, whereas if it spills in here, if there's a small leak, you're just going to get the wood's going to be constantly wet and your shavings are going to be wet. Um, and the food I would normally keep inside the coop, um, or if you do keep it outside, have a way to keep it from being pest proof. Um, so those are roost bars. Let's see, what do I got here? Some nest boxes. Ah, so here are some designs for nest boxes. Um, you can see that first one to the left is great. They have that door on the side for easy access. 
Um, the one in the middle, um, what's really great about this design is that they have this roof. It looks like they almost like didn't quite finish it, but they have this roof on top of the nest boxes inside their coop. Um, the issue with that is if you look at the um, nest boxes all the way to the right, you'll see that they do have dividers between the nest boxes, which is great. It also looks like they have some insulation installed in there. That must be up against a, um, an exposed wall. So they're trying to keep it really warm, which is great. Um, the issue with that one is that the chickens, there's a possibility they will roost on those dividers. They'll sleep on those dividers, which is fine, but they will start pooping into the nest boxes and we don't need that. So um, it's a good idea to have the chickens uh, not be able to get in between the nest boxes. So that design in the middle or the design to the left there, you can see how there's no way the chickens can perch on top of the nest boxes. They're closed off. Um, a bit of a design flaw I'm seeing with this middle design. Um, ideally, you want to have pine shavings in your nest boxes. Um, that's going to keep the eggs cleaner and cut down the amount of time that you need to spend washing eggs. This middle design though, though, I don't see a front edge or a front lip of wood. Um, so the pine shavings probably just spill out of this, these nest boxes, which just means more work for you. You're going to have to spend more time. And also there's a possibility eggs are going to roll right out of the front and you don't want that. Um, so this could be easily fixed by even just a two inch strip of plywood across the bottom of both of these, just to kind of hold those pine shavings in place. Um, all right, I'm going to switch back over here to myself. Um, let's get ahead of myself with the, um, the uh, heat lamp fixture. Um, so where was I? Those are nest boxes. Those are roost bars. Um, oh, for nest boxes, um, ideally you want one nest box per five chickens. Um, I say that, but let's say you have 20 chickens. So you have four nest boxes, if my math is right this early in the morning. Um, the, what's so funny about chickens is they will still pick one nest box. And if any of you are, have chickens, you're laughing at this because you know exactly what I'm talking about. They will pick one nest box and it will be their favorite and they will ignore all the other nest boxes. Um, I used to work with a flock of 300 chickens and they were split up into three or four different um, large chicken tractors that were made of um, hay wagons. So these were huge. Um, so we had a coop that had easily 100, at least 100, maybe 150 birds in it. It was one of the larger ones. And there were, I think, 20 nest boxes in that coop. And every day I went to go collect eggs, there would be eggs in two or three of the nest boxes. Um, I don't know why, but they have, they pick a favorite. So don't be offended if they don't want to use all of your nest boxes that you've constructed for them. Um, just how they behave. Um, so that is that. So I want to talk about outdoor runs a little bit because most of you will be, um, for your chickens, uh, you're going to have an outdoor space. Um, Lisa, yep, you know, exactly. And you'll, they pile up on top of each other and they're jerks about it. It's really fine. Um, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, so let's talk about outdoor run space. Um, so you're going to create an outdoor run for your chickens. And there are a couple different ways you can do this. Um, some folks set up something like a chicken tractor. And uh, that is not a chicken driving a tractor. That is just a chicken coop that is mobile. You can move it through your yard. Um, there's a couple of reasons that folks do that. Um, it means that the chickens get access to new uh, pasture or grass every day. Um, it also means that they will fertilize your lawn, which is great. Um, so that's some uh, pros to having a chicken tractor. Some cons is that they're a little more complicated to build. You know, you have to set up some type of axles, you know, with wheels and make it so the chickens can't crawl underneath that. Um, so it takes a little more work. Um, and you have to be really conscious about uh, the weight of your construction because if you're moving it by hand, it can get really heavy. Um, and another consideration <clears throat> is if you'd like to do a chicken tractor, um, you need to make sure you are staying on top of moving that chicken tractor because if you, let's say you're like, you know what, I'm just going to feed them and water them today. I don't really want to move it. 
your issue could be that the chickens will eventually completely deplete, deplete that grass that's uh, where you have that chicken tractor parked. Um, so if you take too long to move it, you'll know because there'll be a bare patch of grass where you have it. Um, so they can be great as long as you're active in your care of the chickens. Um, but most of you are probably planning on setting up one coop with one outdoor run and just having it be a stationary um, situation. So when you're setting up your outdoor run, you want to make sure it connects really well to the door, the opening for the chickens. Um, so make sure there's uh, adequate chicken wire or hardware cloth um, that you're using. Um, make sure it's something that, that there's no gaps where chickens can sneak under or out. Um, Make sure it's really a great thing if you can add a door that you can fit in and out of. Um, that way, let's say you do have your food or water in the outdoor run space, it's easy for you to reach. Um, and you want to be sure that your fencing ideally is buried. Um, so when you are setting up your fence, you wanna make sure that you dig a little bit of a trench, lay that fencing inside that trench and cover it with dirt. That's gonna deter predators and things from digging underneath the fence. Um, which is ideal. Um, and I, some folks are asking, um, I've gotten questions before about chicken wire versus hardware cloth. Uh, chicken wire is going to be cheaper and in most cases works completely fine. Just as a disclaimer, I have once, and that's in 14 years of having chickens, once I have seen what I assumed was a raccoon um, rip through ch chicken wire. Um, I don't think it was a bear because we didn't really have bears where I was. I used to live down by the shoreline or by Westbrook area. Um, but something ripped through chicken wire. Um, so, you know, if you want to have the Fort Knox of chicken coops, you can use hardware cloth instead. Um, but in most cases, chicken wire is going to be completely fine. Um, so the important things are you want to bury the fencing. Um, you don't necessarily have to put fencing material over the top of your outdoor run. Um, some folks are worried about things like hawks. Um, that could be a concern um, if you have a really large run. Um, hawks like a lot of uh, takeoff and landing space. Um, so if you have your chickens out in the yard, like let's say you do have an outdoor run, but you let them free range during the day, which plenty of folks do, um, that's when you might be worried about hawks. But um, outdoor run, I've never really seen a hawk kind of just jump in that quickly. They like a lot of open space. Um, so make sure you have a door to get in and out for yourself. Make sure it's attached very well to the chicken's door. There's no openings or gaps. Uh, make sure the fence is buried. Um, um, so let's talk about some of the pests you might have. Um, you might have dogs, uh, neighborhood dogs that just decide, oh, I can play with that chicken. Um, foxes, uh, weasels or fisher cats, hawks, um, snakes. Um, raccoons, possums, uh, those are the common ones. So in terms of dogs and foxes, you can basically treat those two predators with the same concern. So you want to make sure if you are free ranging your chickens during the day, ideally if you have a fence around your yard, that's nice. Um, or you just, you're vigilant, you know, maybe you don't let your chickens free range if you're not home during the day. So you can kind of keep an eye on them. Um, it's a good idea to talk to your neighbors first. You know, if they have a dog that kind of tends to roam through the neighborhood, maybe have a conversation with them, explain that you're getting chickens, um, and that those are some concerns that you have. Um, for foxes as well, you want to make sure your coop is really secure. So your fencing is buried, you close your chickens in at night, um, and you don't open them too early in the morning. You know, you're not going out there at 5 a.m. to open your chickens, wait a little bit. Um, and you want to make sure that it's really secure. Um, same thing for a weasel or a fisher cat. Um, they are really great at finding the weaknesses in your fencing or in your coop. So um, just be really vigilant. You know, when you're constructing your coop, make sure that there are no gaps, no openings, even if they're really small. Um, hawks, as I mentioned, hawks aren't really much of an issue unless you are free ranging them in a large outdoor space. Um, some things you can do to prevent hawk predation. Um, you can, uh, this sounds so bizarre, but it works. You can get a, uh, well, I should say, I was about to say run to Staples, but order online from Staples or a similar office supplies a place, blank CDs. Um, and if you hang blank CDs on string, fishing line, whatever, by your coop, it might look really tacky, um, but those flashes um, actually 
um, they're kind of like sensory overload for the hawk and they will try to avoid that area. Um, it's like a big disco ball almost. Um, you don't need a ton of them. Another option some people use is something called scare tape. Um, and that's just reflective thin tape. Um, it's like a, a ribbon and basically they will tie that near their outside of their coop um, just to kind of make that flashing effect as well. Um, so great question here. How large of an outdoor run would you want per chicken square foot? Um, so I think it was Lisa mentioned earlier, one of the common guidelines is 10 square feet per bird. Um, personally, I think it depends on what you have in mind for what that space is going to look like. Um, chickens are great at scrounging and looking for bugs and uh, pecking at the grass, things like that. So if you would like to maybe preserve that space, I would create a larger run for your chickens, maybe as large space as you're able to, you know, within reason in your yard. Um, because if you create a small space, um, for example, I've, I've, I saw a coop before where they had about 10 chickens um, and their run space was about, let's see, it was probably about eight feet by 16 feet maybe. Um, and it was a good sized run for those chickens. They had plenty of space to run around, um, you know, get access to food and water. Um, the issue was uh, they brought that down to dirt really quickly. Um, and so you have an issue where um, they just deplete that grass entirely. So if you can create a large outdoor space, um, that area is gonna be easier to maintain and plant new grass. Um, and maybe even partial it off, maybe only let them have access of one side uh, for a little bit and then switch them over to the other side, um, kind of rotate them, so to speak, so you can kind of keep that grass going um, so they don't wreck that. Other folks, um, I've seen some folks that just have a chicken coop, a small outdoor run, and then that they only use, like let's say if it's raining. Um, and other than that, they let them free range in their yard. And that might not be an option for everyone, so creating a larger outdoor run um, is a good idea. So, so Tom, there's a lot of different guidelines as to how large or how small. Um, you'll see a, a wide range of ideas of what's large versus what's small. Um, Lisa made that suggestion of 10 square feet per bird. I've, seen, I've certainly seen larger, I've seen smaller. Um, just depends on what you want that space to look like and making sure you have um, enough space so that you can be able to run around um, and get some exercise. Um, yeah, of course, happy to help. Um, we're going to leave off with predators. Snakes. Ugh, I don't do snakes. Um, so snakes could get into your coop. Um, same concept as your other predators, though. You want to make sure that you don't have any gaps or any openings. Um, snakes, uh, unless you're planning on moving down to Florida, um, aren't going to go after your chickens. They're going to go after the eggs um, that are in the coop. Um, I've seen pictures of it every once in a while. I've never experienced it myself, thankfully. Um, so same thing, you just want to make sure you're avoiding um, uh, any gaps in your coop. Um, and uh, kind of on a similar tangent, so the snakes are going to want to go after the eggs. Uh, animals like possums and raccoons, they're going to want to go after the feed more than the um, more than the chickens. And that also goes, I didn't add that in here, but skunks. Skunks also enjoy going after chicken food. Um, so a couple of ways to deal with that. You want to make sure your outdoor run is really secure so nothing can sneak in or sneak under. Um, if you are free ranging your chickens during the day um, and you close in your chickens at night, make sure you also close their outdoor run, um, the door to their outdoor run as well. That way nothing can come in even after you've closed the chickens in their coop. Um, and, uh, you know, make sure that's kind of gets into a safety issue. Um, for example, there are a few times where I've almost stepped on a possum going to close on my chickens because I've gone to close them in too late. Um, and something has already been sitting there eating the food. Um, it was a possum. I almost stepped on a possum. Um, and also making sure your coop is really secure. Um, I worked on a farm. We used to have an issue where a coop wasn't constructed well and we had a skunk that was sneaking in every night. Um, and it was my job to get out there and nudge it out of the coop um, with a very large pole on um, the next day. Um, so with all these predators, the main idea is make sure you don't have any gaps, make sure your fence is buried, and make sure you are keeping to a schedule with opening and closing your chickens um, you know, during daylight hours so that nothing's gonna try and sneak in at night. Um, and that should eliminate most of your predator issues. Um, if you are free ranging your chickens during the day, make sure they have, um, make sure you're out there, not, not out there supervising them, but make sure you're home in general. If you're going to be gone for a long part of the day, I wouldn't necessarily let them free range during the day. There's just a lot of things that can happen over the course of the day. 
Um, so it's good idea to be home, just kind of have an ear out in case, you know, neighbor's dog runs into the yard or there's something that, um, how long shall the chickens run for? Good question. Um, so most of the time when I've kept chickens, I will usually open their coop at sunrise, you know, whenever it works well for you. Um, um, what's really cool is that they do make solar powered automatic doors. Um, pretty bougie, um, but they work really well in my experience as long as uh, they're programmed properly. So, um, you know, open them, our chickens here, I usually open them around 8.30 or nine, um, and they have access to their outdoor run um, until close to sunset. Um, and that's something that's really interesting about chickens. If you are free ranging your chickens, um, they will go in when it starts to get dark on their own. Um, and I say that you wanna, let's say you get new chickens, you have them in their coop, you have an outdoor run, and you're letting them in their outdoor run um, during the day. It's a really good idea when you first put your chickens in the coop to keep them in the coop for a day or two so that they learn that's where food is, that's where water is, that means home. Um, unfortunately, I've seen it happen a couple times where uh, I might move chickens into a new coop and I immediately let them out into the outdoor run space and they don't realize like the inside part is home. And so I'm out there at night in the outdoor run, picking up each chicken at a time and putting it into the uh, inside of the coop. So make sure when you first introduce chickens, keep them in the coop for a couple of days, maybe just a day or two is fine. And then introduce them to the outdoor run. And like I said, you can open them early in the morning um, and they'll go in themselves at night and then you just shut the door behind them. Um, and then same goes for free range. Give them a week or two in that chicken coop unit, you know, indoor coop and outdoor run before you decide to let them free range in your yard just so they kind of have a good idea of where home is. Um, and what can be kind of frustrating is if it's not dark enough yet, and let's say you have plans to go out for the night, the chickens might not want to go in. Um, so that's a case where having an automatic door might be really helpful. Um, just make sure it works really well. Don't assume that it's working and, you know, leave for the night. Um, so where are we? How are we doing on time? 10, 15, we're doing good. Um, I want to quickly talk about feed. Um, so make sure your chickens already have fresh, always have fresh water. Um, and in terms of the feed you use, there are a couple different options. Um, right now we're using organic mix uh, here at the farm. Um, it is the fanciest chicken food I've ever seen. It's made of a lot of different kinds of seeds um, and grains. Um, so that's a great option. Um, they also, so the main categories though, um, that's not as common. What you normally see is either crumble, mash, or pellets. Um, and that's the type of feed. So mash is just almost like powdered feed. Um, it looks like sand. It's kind of, um, and that is just everything mixed up. There's crumble, which kind of has a little bit more aggregates, um, picture like crumbs. Um, and that's what it really looks like. And there's also pellets, uh, which is pelleted feed. Um, if anybody ever been to a pet store, or had a pet rabbit or guinea pig, things like that, it's just the little pellets. Um, I haven't noticed any big differences between using any of the types of feed. Just be aware that if you switch from one feed to the other, the chickens may need some time to adjust and their laying might decrease for a couple of days while they adjust to the new type of feed. Um, personally, I'm a fan of using pellets. Um, just because the mash is a little messier, it's kind of easier to spill. Um, so I've usually used pellets, um, but any of them really work. Um, and we always try to use organic feed here at the farm, obviously being an organic farm. Um, so we use organic feed, which is a little different. Like I said, it's made up of actual seeds and grains, and it's not just a, um, extruded feed made into the pellets. Um, you can order from a local feed store, track supply has things that you need. Um, yeah, there's not really a huge difference on the feed. Just it's a good idea if you pick one, try and stick with it. Uh, Cause if you would, if you switch it around a lot, the chickens will take some time to adjust. Um, depending on the setup you have for your chickens, it's also gonna be a great idea to use oyster shell. Um, and when I say oyster shell, I don't mean a whole shell. I mean um, oyster shell crushed. Um, and that's something you'll also be able to find at a feed store or a place like a tractor supply. Um, oyster shell is great because it contains calcium and the chickens will ingest some of the crushed oyster shell and that calcium will go towards their egg production. Um, it's also uh, very helpful because um, chickens uh, don't have teeth. 
thankfully. It's kind of scary if they did, right? Um, so they actually have an organ called a gizzard that's going to uh, crush up that food and a crop that's going to hold that food. And they will ingest small stones, or in this case, the oyster shell, um, to help crush up that food. So let's say you have an outdoor run and it's pretty large and there's some little gravel and stones, tiny pea-sized gravel, things like that, that you know they're eating. Or let's say you let them free range in your yard. Um, they're gonna get those rocks, but the oyster shell is kind of a double whammy because it's gonna help them digest their food better and it's also gonna help them with the calcium content of their eggs. Um, the chickens will get calcium through their feed and if from any grazing they might do, but the oyster shells are a really great bonus. Um, so, I think I'm keeping up on, I did see one question earlier about predators. I want to scroll back there. Um, would a chicken coop attract a predator that would threaten our dog? That's a good question. Um, I think that most predators are opportunistic. Um, if they see a food source, they're going to keep going back. So if you have a chicken coop and you've sealed it up really well, um, there's no way a predator's getting in there. Sure, you might get a fox or maybe a coyote that investigates um, that coop. But if they, after a couple of visits, realize, you know what? I can't get into this. I can't get any food. Um, I don't have any access to this. They're gonna move on. Um, if your chicken coop isn't as ideal, or let's say you aren't great keeping up a schedule and those chickens stay out really late, or you leave the door open to their coop really late. Um, you know, if there's a mother fox trying to feed her young and she gets one chicken, she's gonna go back a couple times trying um, get more food. Um, so if you create that habit for the predators that they know they aren't getting in there, um, that's going to set up a good precedent to make sure they don't come back. Um, I've seen foxes. I've seen, um, I did see a coyote once uh, try and get into our chicken coop. Um, but you know, once they realize they can't get in, they usually avoid it. Um, so I hope that helps with the dog question. Um, if you have a larger dog, even better. They usually uh, deter the predators just from the smell being in the yard. Um, some quick things about medical concerns with chickens, um, and then we're going to get into chicks um, because most of you are talking about maybe getting chicks. Um, some medical things. So I guess I can start by saying chicken diseases um, are pretty infrequent, which is great. Um, chickens in general are pretty robust and pretty healthy. Um, but if a chicken does come down with an illness, it can often be very difficult to diagnose um, because it's the kind of thing where one symptom could mean four or five different diseases. So there are a lot of different ways to look at that. I'm gonna kind of share with you what I've done over the course of the years and hopefully that's helpful. Um, so what you'll notice if a chicken isn't doing well is it's not active, um, it's not alert. Um, which in general with most animals, if you notice that, that's the issue. Um, so if you have a chicken that's off in a corner and it's not eating, or if it hasn't left the coop yet, um, not to be confused with sitting laying an egg, but if it's just like standing in the coop or staying on the roost bar and it's not moving, um, and it's almost like uh, they have, you'll notice they have poor posture is really what it is. They're, they're kind of, they'll, their head will be sunken in and their back will kind of be at an odd angle usually. Um, and it's, it's hard, it's almost as if you said, you know what, that chicken like looks like it's chilly and is like huddled up. Like that's what you'll notice um, when a chicken isn't doing well. Um, usually what I do is I isolate that chicken. I usually set up either a, like I have a small um, cage. If you have a dog crate at home, um, you honestly, even like a Rubbermaid bin with some chicken wire over the top, you wanna isolate that chicken. Um, make sure it has aspects of food and water um and uh warmth so you know i might put it in you know a downstairs bathroom or if you have a heated garage um just to give it some quiet some access to food and water um and usually uh it's something that passes quickly and the chicken's over it in a day or two um occasionally you will get a bird that is continuing to not do well um, and like i said diagnosing an illness can be really challenging um and that's where i think you need to make a decision as a owner of livestock. You know, you're kind of a farmer now. Um, I know folks that will bring a sick chicken immediately to a vet, which you certainly can do. Um, it's not going to be cheap, um, but thankfully there are certain um, livestock vets. For example, one that's local that I can highly recommend is Country Companions. Uh, they do uh, farm visits or livestock calls. They're great. Um, that's who we use here at the farm. 
Um, but you know, with any vet, uh, you know, if you have a sick chicken, that, that could be expensive. Um, and if you have 20 birds, uh, that could add up pretty quickly. So in general, I always try to keep them isolated, give them food, give them water, um, and maybe just call a vet and see if they have any recommendations. Um, another common issue you might have that is pretty treatable is mites. Um, and thankfully mites, uh, if you have a clean coop, if you have a new coop, um, that you didn't get secondhand from someone. And if you get your chickens from a reputable source, mites usually shouldn't be an issue for you. Um, but if you get a coop secondhand and maybe you didn't bleach it very well, or if you are getting chickens from a friend, um, that's where you might run into some issues. And mites are pretty treatable. There are some topical treatments you can get from a feed supply store like Trash Supply. Um, and you just want to make sure you're keeping up on those applications and you're keeping your coop really clean. Um, and that's how you avoid that issue with the mites. Um, got a question here. I noticed with chicken coop models that coops made for just one or two chickens don't have nest boxes listed as a feature, at least in this CT builder, would I just put in a single nesting box on my own? Um, you certainly could. Yeah. Um, and like I said before, if the, if you're getting a prefab kit, just make sure it's really solid. Unfortunately, some of the ones that are sold like hardware stores and stuff like that aren't that great so just make sure it's you know sturdy uh, check reviews things like that um, but if you have um, a small number of chickens I mean I would recommend three or more um, having one or two chickens isn't that great chickens are social animals um, so I recommend a minimum of three um, but in that case yeah you can install a nest box on your own like I said a couple of pieces of plywood um, a little lip up front just to keep the shavings from spilling out um, that'd be great um, dust bath. Yes, dust baths are great or horrible. Um, let me explain why. Um, you should let your chicken dust bathe. That's not saying they shouldn't. Um, so a dust bath is um, a chicken's natural way of cleaning itself. Um, so what a chicken will do is it will get to a space with dust and it will, um, and don't get nervous. The first time you see a chicken dust bathing, you'll say, oh my god, my chicken is writhing on the ground. It's dying. Someone help. It's not. It's dust bathing. Um, what they do is they will lie down sideways in the dirt and they usually fan out a wing and they fan out their legs and they ruffle up their feathers. Um, and what they're doing is they're getting dust in between all of their feathers and that is suffocating any mites or parasites or insects that are getting into their feathers. Um, so yes, dust bathing is a perfect way to cut down on those mite issues. Um, I don't have it on my list because in my head it's something they just do naturally. I don't think of it as something I have to do, but you want to make sure you provide a good space for that. So that can mean a couple different things. Let's say you uh, can only have it a small outdoor run. Let's say you have a small backyard, you have a really small outdoor run. Um, something you can do, uh, feed stores will sell these small black soft rubber feed containers, usually like for grain, things like that. Um, you can fill that with um, actual dust and they will, you can find that, uh, what you can use is diatomaceous earth. Um, that's a great uh, use for that. However, in general, the chickens will make a dust bath for themselves. So what they will do is through all that scrounging around in their outdoor run in their space um, is they will eventually eliminate the grass. And when they eliminate the grass, that dirt is going to dry up. And what the chickens will start to do, and I should have pointed what out when we were outside, is they will actually make a small indentation in the ground with that dried up dirt. And they mix it themselves and they create a dust bath for themselves to use, um, which is great for an outdoor run, right? You're, they, have, they have their dust bath right there. You don't have to do anything. Um, it is not great if you have them free ranging in your yard, because then you have chicken craters. Um, I've seen that happen a lot where like all of a sudden they just decide they don't want to dust bathe in their outdoor run and they make a bunch of little craters out in your yard. Um, so if you can encourage them to create a space inside their outdoor run, um, that's better. Um, how often is just cleaning the coop out in the proper way? Good question. Um, oh, Lisa. Yeah. So the diatomaceous earth, thank you for pointing that out. Um, diatomaceous earth, just be careful with it. It is a dust. Um, so just be careful um, using that. You don't want to breathe that in. Um, also, if you are interested in beekeeping, um, you want to avoid the diatomaceous earth. Um, I've heard that's not great for bees. So in general, it's a lot safer to just try and let the chickens dust bathe themselves, make their own uh, natural uh, dust bath. Um, 
So someone asked about cleaning. Um, so let's talk about that and we're gonna jump into ordering chicks and taking care of chicks because um, that is usually the start to having chickens. Um, so when you clean, what I usually do is I have pine shavings inside the nest boxes to keep the eggs clean um, you know, before you collect them. Uh, I also normally use pine shavings on the ground of the coop. Um, I find that pine shavings are generally pretty cheap, pretty lightweight. They absorb moisture, uh, absorb the moisture really well, which is great. Um, so you can go fewer times between cleanings. Um, and it just works out a little easier. And it's also great for compost because um, it's already had a large surface area and it can break down pretty quickly if you're mixing it properly into your compost. Um, that's a whole other topic. We are doing a compost lecture a couple weeks down the line here. Um, some folks use hay or straw. That can work. It doesn't absorb the water as well. And in general, it's messier to clean up. Um, I do advise people against using sand um, because sand does not hold moisture um, and it just doesn't work as well. So and in terms of how frequently to clean, um, that kind of gets into your own personal preference. Um, I've seen folks that will, as soon as their chicken coop has a couple droppings in it, they will clean the whole thing out. Um, personally, I feel like that results in a lot of unused shavings. Um, and in general, um, is kind of a waste of money for you. I've also seen folks, um, like honestly some family members I have, that will go way too long between cleanings um, the chicken coop smells really bad um, and it can actually become like a respiratory issue for chickens if you let it go too long. So we don't want to be on that side of the spectrum either. Um, so in general, what I do is I keep an eye on the shavings and once I notice that the ratio of shavings to manure is starting to balance out and it's like, you know what, there's, there's a decent amount of manure in here and it doesn't smell that great. Once it's starting, it sounds like kind of a rough guideline, but once it's starting to smell, once I kind of open it, I'm like, hmm, you know, I can actually like smell it today. Um, that's when I usually know it's time to clean out. Um, the reason I say that is you, uh, you don't want to wait too long because that's unhealthy for the birds, but you also don't want to clean too frequently because then you're wasting pine shavings. So if you wait for the coop to be a little dirty, um, that's great because that's going to make composting the shavings easier because there's carbon in your shavings and there's nitrogen in the manure and those are going to mix and great and make excellent compost. Um, so I know that's not a firm guideline like, oh, you know, you wait, you know, X amount of days, but for just as an example, I used to take care of a flock of, uh, you know, my, my home coop I had it used to be 10 birds and I'd clean out that coop about maybe every three weeks. Um, and that depends on the weather too. If you're letting them free range every day and they're outside, their coop isn't gonna be that dirty. They're gonna sleep there at night, they're gonna lay their eggs, and besides that, they're gonna be outside the coop. But let's say it's winter time and they're in that coop a lot, it's gonna get dirtier quicker. Um, and a proper way to clean out a coop, uh, what I'll do is I will, I will use a rake or a garden hoe to rake all the shavings out of the wheelbarrow. What I usually like to do is leave the coop uh, an hour or two to dry out in case, let's say, you, you know, you might have given it a little too long and the, the bottom wood is wet. Um, I'll give that an hour or two to dry out and then I'll put fresh shavings down. I usually put like maybe two inches, an inch of shavings. Um, the, the shavings and the nest box should be pretty clean. As long as you set up your nest boxes, the chickens weren't pooping in them. Um, kind of back to those designs I showed you. Um, the nest box shavings should stay pretty clean, but once again, stay on top of that. You know, the chickens might push some of the shavings out, so keep up on making sure there's shavings in there. Um, anything else about cleaning out the coop? Uh, winter, in winter, cleaning out your coop. Something you could do uh, to clean out your coop is called windrowing um, or overwintering your coop, and that's a little bit different style of cleaning out your coop. Um, so what you do is it's cold and your chickens could be cold. So what you do is once you notice your shavings start to get pretty dirty, rather than clean out the whole coop and open the door and clean out all the shavings and lose all that insulation, something you can do in the winter time is actually put a fresh layer of shavings on top. Um, and ideally what happens over the, north, over the course of a couple weeks is you get layers, you get shavings, manure, shavings, manure. Um, and you might get like a foot 
of bedding in the bottom of your coop. Um, and some of you are thinking, okay, that sounds really gross. That's a lot of manure in my coop. Is that gonna smell? Um, if you figure out the proper way, the proper ratio, um, which is a matter of sight and smell, um, it's not gonna be that gross because what you're doing is you're creating a compost pile inside your coop. And that's gonna do a couple of things. It cuts down on the work for you. Um, it's gonna create a physical layer of heat. There's more insulation on the floor of your coop. Um, and it's also gonna create chemical heat from the actual breakdown, um, the decomposition in that layer is actually gonna create uh, uh, chemical heat as well. Um, so it's a great way, a uh, passive way to heat your coop in the winter time. Um, and then usually what I'll do is by late March or April, um, you can tell that that layer is starting to heat up um, and it'll start to smell. So usually that's when I'll do a full clean out once we're kind of getting some warmer weather. Um, so any questions on those things I talked about before we talk about chicks in this last half hour here? Um, I'll keep an eye on the comments and if not, I will jump over to um, my PowerPoint here because I have some cool photos of some chick ordering. Uh, let's see here. So um, here is a uh, example of the heat lamp. Um, so you'll see there's a holder there and the actual lamp itself. Some quick notes about that. For the holder, for the heat lamp, having that uh, metal wire protector on the front is a really great idea in case, you know, God forbid it fell in your coop, you don't want to start a fire. So having that um, extra little wire mesh in front is a really great protective measure. Um, making sure you have a nice sturdy clamp so you can adjust the angle of your lamp. And if you look at the actual bulb itself, um, something they don't really make abundantly clear on the label for that, uh, don't touch the bulb with your fingers directly. And I don't mean when it's on, I mean when it's off as well. Um, these bulbs get so hot that the oil that's naturally on your fingers can heat up to the point where that bulb can break. Um, when it gets turned on. So whenever you open a, a box of these bulbs, make sure you use either rubber gloves or I'm pretty cheap. I usually use a paper towel just to grab it and secure it into the, um, into the uh, holder there. Uh, da, 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 da. Do I do a bleach cleaning in spring and fall? Um, in general, I don't. Um, if you're having really consistent issues with, you know, that maybe you have some chickens that are, had an illness and you notice there was something that went through your coop, I might do a bleach cleaning. Um, it's something you certainly can do as long as you do it properly, use the proper ratio, you know, like use the advisories, don't use a, don't just dump bleach in your coop, obviously. Um, I usually don't, um, but you certainly could if you notice that there was maybe a respiratory illness that went through your birds, or um, if you had like a lot of mold growth for some reason, and that might tell you that you're not cleaning out your coop frequently enough. Um, so that's a good question, Lisa. I'm sure you could as long as you use the, um, you know, you use the advisories on a ratio, but I usually haven't. Um, so where are we here? Let's, let's go to raising chicks. Um, the fun part of chickens, right? Before the eggs. Um, oh, and I, I have some other photos here. So here are some examples of some breeds before we get into the actual um, chicks. So starting at the top and going clockwise, uh, that is a barred rock chicken. That's one of the most popular breeds. Um, Next there, kind of the three o'clock, that's a Polish chicken. Um, those are really popular with folks. Um, as you can tell, they look really goofy, so they're fun. However, I will just say that they don't usually do that great with New England winters. So if you are gonna have them, just make sure you have a really well insulated coop. Um, in general, I've just noticed they aren't as hardy as other breeds, so. but I wanna include them in there because they are pretty popular. Uh, moving down, that white chicken, that's a white leghorn. Um, if you buy white eggs in the grocery store, they most likely come from that breed of chicken. Um, they're a great breed of chicken. They're super productive. Um, however, like most white egg layers, they can be a little flighty. Um, <laughs> and they're good escape artists. I once washed a white leghorn uh, half walk, half fly up the side of a chain link fence. Um, so they can be kind of escape artists. Um, continuing around that circle, uh, that is a turkin. That is a uh, bare-necked chicken. Uh, it's not missing feathers. That is just the breed. Um, I've had them before. Uh, in general, I've noticed their disposition. They're actually super sweet, um, if you can get over how goofy they look. Um, and then almost at the top there, that is a Rhode Island Red. That's actually a rooster in that photo. 
Um, there's a couple ways you can tell. Um, it's a young rooster, if anything. Um, but based on their feather patterns, kind of got a little more tail feathers there. Um, but those are some common um, breeds you have there. Let's see here. Uh, no one mentioned meat chickens. So we'll skip that for now. Um, so let's say you've ordered your chicks and they're on the way, which I know some of you said you have some chicks on the way. You want to make sure you have a brooder that is set up well for them. And a brooder is just the term for the space you have um, to raise your chicks in. Um, and basically, you want to make sure it's safe. So you want to make sure it's away from predators or any pets you have, um, cats, dogs, um, and keep your heat lamp secured. Uh, I showed you that diagram that had the, uh, has a really solid clamp on it. Um, you don't want it falling into the brooder. Um, and make sure it's escape proof. So make sure there's a lid on top of your brooder or chicken wire. Uh, make sure there's no gaps in the sides um, so that the chicks can't escape as they get larger and start to get their wing feathers. Um, so you need at least one heat lamp. And usually what I advise, any of you that uh, might have uh, pets that need uh, heat requirements like reptiles, you'll, you'll, this will sound familiar, but you wanna keep it on one side of the brooder. And the reason you do that is so that the chicks can self-regulate their heat. You know, if they're too hot, they'll move away from the heat lamp. If they're too cold, they'll move back. Um, and you want to keep an eye on the temperature. You are going to want to get a thermometer when ordering chicks because um, week one, you want that brooder at least under the heat lamp to be at 95 degrees. And then each week, you can bring that temperature down by five degrees until you reach room temperature. Um, and there's a little bit of a, a cheat to know if your brooder is too hot or too cold. Let's say you can't get your hands off a, you know, a weather thermometer or something like that. Um, here's what, how you can tell. So starting from left to right here, you know your brooder is too hot if your chicks are all staying out of the heat lamp entirely. They're all staying away from it. That means your, your temperature is too hot. I would raise the heat lamp if you're experiencing that. Pull it farther away from the brooder, raise it. Um, on the other side there on the right, it's too cold if all of your chicks are completely huddled up underneath that heat source. If you see that, I would move that heat lamp closer to the brooder, lower it down. Um, and in case some of you are wondering how to do that, uh, what I've done in the past is I'll set up a, um, you know, if I'm in a garage or something, I'll hang the light from the ceiling or from a uh, maybe a two by four I've hung over the brooder. Um, and I kind of lower it on a pulley or even just readjust the, the rope I have it tied with. Um, and you'll know your temperature is just right if your chicks are spread out around the brooder. You know, some are under the heat lamp, some aren't. Um, that's when you know you're kind of in the right spot there. So um, that's kind of a bit of a more uh, hands-off approach without measuring the temperature um, as you go. Uh, but in general, having a thermometer is going to be really helpful for you. Um, food and water. So make sure they always have clean water. Um, they're going to mess up the water quickly. That's going to be one of your biggest uh, uh, time spenders when you get new chicks is changing out the water um, because they're going to step in it. They're going to run past it and knock shavings into it. Um, it's just what they do. So you're going to be changing out water. And because the water is in a environment that's 90 or 95 degrees, that water that you use um, can get gross really quick. Um, so when you do change out the water, um, Every once in a while, make sure you actually give that bottom base and the, the water fountain itself a good scrub um, just to make sure that there's no buildup of um, kind of just some uh, bacteria buildup. Um, in terms of the feed, um, you can use medicated feed. And what that medicated feed is, um, it's kind of a, um, oh shoot, I'm drawing a mind blank. Um, it's medicating against, I believe it's Merrick's disease. I'm going to have to follow up with an email. Uh, there's a disease that it vaccinates against through the feed. Um, just be aware that uh, some chicks can also come vaccinated, and that's an option when you order the chicks, and I highly advise you do that. Um, so you can click a little box and order chicks um, to say it is uh, uh, medicated. Coccidiosis. Thank you, Lisa. I had a, I had a feeling you were going to jump in and help me out. That's it. Um, so, and then there's a uh, vaccine for Merrick's disease as well. Um, the chickens can get. Um, just keep in mind that if you get the vaccine th with the chicks when you order them, then the feed, if you get medicated feed, they can actually cancel each other out. So um, in general, I get unmedicated feed and I just get the vaccinations when I order the chicks online. Um, and I just get standard feed. 
Um, there, it does, there is special chick feed that you will get. Um, it's higher in protein than what your actual normal chicken food would be. Uh, it's smaller granules, so the chick can eat it. Um, let's see here. Do I have a spot that talks about introducing them to? Um, okay, I don't. So when you introduce them to your brooder, you get your box of chicks. You pick them up from the post office. You heard that right. Pick it up from the post office. Um, and you are taking your chicks out and putting them into your brooder. Um, a couple things. Your brooder, you want the floor to be pine shavings, but for the first couple days, you want newspaper on top of that pine shavings. Let me be very clear here. You don't want just newspaper the first couple days. You want pine shavings with newspaper on top. A um, couple reasons for that. It's going to prevent their legs from splaying or having muscle issues um, because they have a soft surface. And the newspaper is going to keep them from trying to eat the shavings the first couple days, thinking that's food instead of what you have in their bowl. Um, and then after a couple days, once they know where to find their food in their little feeder, you can take the newspaper away. Um, and same thing as with a uh, regular chicken coop. Keep an eye on it. If it starts to get, look really messy or starts to smell, definitely clean it up. Um, Something I usually experience is they'll get the water area messier fast. And so I'll usually, you know, kind of spot clean by their water. Um, and when you take the chicks out of their box and put them into the brooder, dip each chick's beak into the water. Gently, you know, just their beak into the water so they know where to find it. Um, you're going to want to make sure you do that for each of the chicks that you take out of the box. So when you take it out of the box, dip its beak in the water and then let it go in the brooder. Um, and I think, uh, how are we doing on time here? I want to show you, um, we got a couple more minutes here. I want to show you, uh, what some of the ways are to order chicks. Um, let's see if I can get onto, although of course, if I check McMurray, they're all going to say sold out, go away. Um, but that's all right. Let's see if we can find. So, can I screen share with you again? There we are. So, here's one of the popular um, websites for ordering chicks. This is uh, Murray, Murray Hatchery. Um, some other common hatcheries are Meyer Hatchery, um, Cackle Hatchery, Welp Hatchery, W E L P. Um, there's a couple others out there, but uh, McMurray is one of the uh, more popular ones. Um, so you'll get under their website and you'll have some options here. So I'm going to go over to chicks and I'll just click all baby chicks. And like I said, at this point, they are really sold out. Um, so we probably won't see actual like cart uh, quantities in here. Um, but you will have some choices. So uh, do your research if you have a certain preference for breeds. In general, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to click on brown egg layers because brown egg layers, uh, as a general rule, are usually more calm and docile than white egg layers. Um, there's no nutritional difference in the eggs between white and brown. It depends on what you're feeding them. Um, wow, they've updated their website. This is very handy. Look at this. I mean, I'm going to choose. I don't want any small eggs. I want large and extra large eggs. Um, and I want. I will be lenient. I'll say I want good, better, or best egg production. Um, oh, and also very important. I, when you're a first time chicken owner, I always advise to get a standard breed and not a bantam breed. Bantam breed is like a, uh, a toy breed of chicken. Um, the issue with that is that bantams, if you were to order bantam chickens, yes, they're smaller, they're cuter, but they do not come sexed. You can't order just females. Um, so that means you are going to wind up, excuse me, with a rooster um, eventually. And that could happen if you order sex chickens. Let's say I order 50 female chicks. There's a good chance one of them is going to wind up being male. Um, just it's going to happen eventually. You know, they can only uh, be so accurate with their uh, sexing in the hatchery. So I've selected my quantifications here, what I want my chickens to be. Um, and I am going to go, let's see here. Ooh, Buff Orpingtons. Those are one of my favorites. I'm going to click on them. Um, Buff Orpingtons are known as being a really calm breed. Oftentimes folks with kids say, what kind of, uh, chicken should I get? I usually say Buff Orpington. They're very, very calm. Um, chickens are just known for being very relaxed, which is great. Um, so 
Buff Orpingtons, they have some descriptions there for you and they have some options. So I'm gonna click on females. Let's say I'm going big, I want 15 chickens. I'm gonna add it to my cart. Um, go to my cart there. Um, and as you go farther down, I won't go through this because it'll start asking for credit card info and things. I'm not actually ordering chickens today. Um, you're gonna want the option of getting them vaccinated. Um, and uh, there are some options. For example, they let you order something called um, grow gel, which is something you can add to uh, their water um, or their feed even that helps kind of boost their vitamin intake at the start. I've done that, it works pretty well. Um, you don't have to, it's just kind of an extra boost for them. It's like Gatorade almost, um, getting them vaccinated. So, um, and you wanna make sure you have the brooders set up before the chicks arrive because they're gonna be tired, um, they're gonna be hungry. Basically what a hatchery does is as soon as a chick is born, it will get shipped. Um, the reason they do that is that when a chick hatches, it has the food and water that it needs to survive for between 48 to 72 hours. Um, just from absorbing the yolk and the egg. So that's why you ship a chick as soon as it's born. Um, because if you were to wait a couple days, it wouldn't be able to make the trip. Um, but you wanna have the brooder set up and ready to go in advance. That way they're not waiting in the box when you get them. Um, oh, Tom, good question about that with the wire bottom. Um, you could, I'm honestly, I, I think I'm just so used to using the shavings with the newspaper on top. I think it's a little softer on their feet when they're small. Um, there's plenty of people and even like commercial producers that use wire bottoms um, for uh, like indoor chicken coops, you know, like if it's in a, like a production facility, um, just because all the droppings fall through and it's easier. Um, for chicks though, honestly, I feel like it'd be more of a hassle to set up a wire bottom than it would be to just get a box and fill it with your pine shavings with newspaper on top. Um, so I'm not confident to say yes or no with chicks. In general, I just never have. And I think it might be a little tougher on their feet. Um, whereas it's, you know, I've seen that done plenty of times with adult chickens. Um, oh, ordering chicks. Try and avoid tractor supply. Tractor supply is a great place to get lots of great products, but in general, I tell folks to avoid ordering chicks from tractor supply. And if you already have, no worries. Like, you know, maybe that worked out great for you. I just find that, you know, tractor supply is ordering their chicks from another place. They're then going to tractor supply and trying to get adjusted to that home. And then they're getting moved to your house. It's a lot of transitions for really young animals and it's a lot of stress for them. Um, so in general, I try and avoid it. I feel like you probably wouldn't get as healthy animals from track supply as you would from ordering from a hatchery. Um, so just want to add that in. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left here. I did just want to add in, there's some great resources for you to use. Um, there are there's a, uh, some great resources by uh, Story Literature. That's like the uh, author group. Um, and I can include these in an email for you that has guides on poultry. Um, a great website is My Backyard Chicken. There are a lot of forums in there to ask questions about chickens. If you have a question, I'm sure someone else has asked it on My Backyard Chicken. Um, there's a great book called The Backyard Homestead. That's a great introduction to all the different things, chickens, and I can include that uh, in your uh, my email as well. Um, egg eaters, Lisa has a great question. Any suggestions for egg eaters? So, yes, unfortunately, Chickens can sometimes, and thankfully it's pretty rare, get in the horrible habit of eating their own eggs. And usually how this gets started is one egg gets laid and it accidentally gets cracked. And um, that might be because maybe there isn't enough calcium in their diet and the egg wasn't as strong. So another reason for oyster shell. Um, maybe you were collecting eggs one day and you accidentally dropped one and it cracked. Um, the chickens will get curious about this and they will eat it. So you have to stop that because you want to eat the eggs instead of the chickens eating the eggs. Um, so one thing to do is to boost the calcium in their diet. So get some oyster shell out there um, so that the eggs are literally harder for them to crack because eventually they'll start to crack them themselves. They'll learn that there's food in there and they'll start to crack it open themselves. Um, but let's say you know, you've know you got calcium and there's still breaking eggs. You're finding broken eggs out there, broken eggshells. Here's what you're gonna do you are going to get some eggs. And whether that means, um, you know, collect, quickly collecting the ones that aren't broken, um, or if they're really bad and they're getting all of them in the coop, um, 
you might have to buy some from the store. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna sabotage the egg. You are gonna get the egg and you're gonna um, peck a little hole in it, use like a needle or you know even like a you know a fork might even work, um, and pour out the contents of that egg. Get all the contents out so you have an empty eggshell that still looks intact. Fill it with spicy brown mustard, um, and then put it back in the coop. Um, it's yellow. It's roughly the same color as the egg yolk. The chickens will see that, say, hey, look at that food, and look, the eggshell's already cracked. They will start to peck that. They will hate the taste, and they'll learn to stop eating the eggs. Um, so first step, try and boost the calcium. Second step, try and be really vigilant about collecting eggs, like be out there every morning, you know, check in the afternoon so they don't have the chance for it to sit there. You know, maybe you have one egg eater in the group. Um, hopefully not get a chance, but if all else fails, the mustard trick. Um, do you suggest not having a rooster to keep an eye on the hens? Um, so full disclosure, when I eventually uh, have my own uh, chicken flock down the road, I mean, I've cared for many over the years, but I don't have, uh, it's difficult to have chickens when you live in an apartment. Um, but when I eventually have chickens down the line, I do plan on having a rooster. Um, for most folks though, a rooster probably isn't a great choice. Um, your neighbors might not like the consistent noise um, and they might complain. Uh, and I know someone asked a question about zoning regulations. Uh, someone recommended check with your town hall. That's correct. Check with your town hall for the zoning regulations. Um, in addition, just, you know, maybe running it by your neighbors. Um, neighbors who don't like noisy chickens will not like them less if you give them some eggs. Um, sorry, I'm getting off lots of tangents here. Roosters in general, they're noisy, so your neighbors don't like them as much. Um, they can be aggressive. Um, and what is really weird is roosters tend to be aggressive towards specific people. Um, like for example, I've seen roosters that go after one caretaker, or I've seen a couple roosters for some, I have no idea why, will go after female uh, employees or female farmers. Um, I've also seen roosters that for whatever reason uh, leave adults alone, but will chase kids. Um, and roosters can cause some damage if they're large enough. Um, roosters, on the back of their heel, they have something called a spur, um, and it's a claw meant for defense. Um, and they will go after people with that, and it can hurt, um, and it can, it can, you know, break skin. Um, so they can attack people, they can make noise, but Peter, you bring up a great point. They can defend a, a coop. So let's say you do have a dog come to the yard or, you know, a possum trying to sneak in to get food. A rooster will attack, you know, the invader. Um, a rooster will go after a hawk if it's, you know, descended and trying to like get to the hens. Um, and most importantly, a rooster will actually warn the hens of danger. Um, so there's a specific noise a rooster will make um, that means different predators. For example, I've worked with chickens long enough to know what noise a rooster will make if there's a hawk in the sky. Um, like I recognize a noise and be, oh, look around and sure enough, I'll see a hawk flying overhead. Um, so they're great at warning the hens when there's danger so the hens can run and dive under the coop, things like that. Um, so, you know, if you have neighbors that are really close that you think might have an issue with it, or if you have kids, or if you have, you know, maybe folks taking care of the chickens that are hesitant to, you know, give a rooster a shove if it tries to attack them, I would avoid it, um, but you know, I'm comfortable giving a rooster a shove if it decides to attack me and, um, you know, hopefully I'm planning on, uh, you know, having neighbors that like my chickens because I'll be giving them eggs. So there are some pros and cons to consider. Um, and you might wind up with a rooster anyways, especially if you order a large amount of chicks, they might mess up, which happens. Um, and you might wind up with a rooster. So if that does happen, um, reach out to local farms. There's also, uh, changed names recently. There's a Facebook group. Um, let's see if I can find it here. It was, uh, I think it's called Connecticut Agriculture. Um, and that's a great place to post if you're trying to find a home for a rooster. Um, if you're really struggling and just can't find um, a home for a rooster, uh, Middle Field Livestock Auction is a place to go for that too. Um, and you can try to socialize a rooster. Sometimes it works really well. Um, sometimes it doesn't. Like I've had roosters that I leave alone and they're great and they're fine. They never bother anyone. Like I, I've brought kids in and the rooster's fine. Um, but on this opposite side of the spectrum, I had a rooster that I tried to socialize every day. Um, I had kids hold it when it was tiny, pick it up. Um, and unfortunately this was a farm that also hosted events. 
and everything was going great until the rooster chased the guy in a three-piece suit across the farm. Um, so it just depends on the, the demeanor of the animal. Um, so if that answers your question. Um, so let's see, we've covered raising chicks, feed, um, you know, manage that smile, having that style, having them outdoors, indoors, predator issues, medical concerns, building a coop, buying a coop. Um, yeah, I think that I covered most of it. Is there any other aspects of chicken keeping that I didn't cover? Ooh, good question, Lisa. Integrating new birds to an existing flock. Um, so let's say you already have chickens and maybe they're getting older and not laying as much and you wanna get some new ones. Um, a couple things to do to uh, limit the fighting that could happen. Um, Number one, you wanna try and introduce birds that are the same size or close to the same size as your current chickens. So if you're raising chicks, try and keep them separate from your adult birds until they're you know, at least three months old, you know, close to adult size. Um, otherwise, they're gonna get pecked on a lot um, by the older birds. Um, that's the first thing, try and introduce them when they're the same size. Um, introducing them at night. So when you close in your chickens for the night and you have your new chickens, um, put them in at night because uh, a chicken will be more aware if it's being introduced to a stranger during the day uh, than at night. It'll wake up in the morning and it's just everyone's there all at once. So introducing them at night is better. Um, and encouraging distractions. So um, something I used to do for chickens that were fighting is I got cabbage wrapped it in wire and hung it from the ceiling and they pecked at that. Um, also Coke cans filled with gravel um, that they peck at can be helpful if you are noticing them fighting. Having some enrichment for them can be helpful. Um, how long to keep chicks in the brooder before going into the coop? Good question, Tom. Um, so <laughs> my rule when I was growing up raising chickens was as, so a little bit of backstory, when I used to raise chicks, um, going out into the coop, uh, I raised them in my bedroom in a brooder. Um, and my rule was when I used to come home from school and the chicks were on my bed instead of in the brooder, that was my call that they had to go outside. Um, but no, in general, they're going to um, eventually outgrow the brooder. And you can tell they're running from left to right in the brooder. Um, they are um, trying to fly. They're starting to get their adult feathers. Um, and eventually they will just outgrow the brood that you've created. So a couple different things you can do. You want to try and introduce them into the coop when it's warm out. Um, you know, like today we're getting about 50 degrees, but you know, just a couple days ago we had like a 35 degree day. Um, that can be a little cold for young chicks. So ideally I like to wait to see a lot of feather development on the chicks before I put them outside. Um, so in most cases that winds up being about the two to three month mark when they're going outside. Um, and so they'll be, you know, you get a new chick that's about this big. A bird that's two to three months is gonna be about this big, you know, like uh, pigeon size, so to speak. That's usually when I say, all right, you're, you're about ready to go out. Um, large pigeon size. Um, you know, wait to see a lot of adult feather development. Um, and if you can, like I said, if you're introducing them to a new coop, Keep them in the coop for a couple days before putting them in their runs if they know that that is home, that's where food is. Um, and also you can monitor them a little closer, make sure they're getting the heat that they need. Um, and if you are putting them out in the coop and it's still a little chilly out, you can put a heat lamp in the coop um, to keep them warm at night. Um, so if that answered your question there. Um, any other questions for now? Um, I know we're, we're, we're over by about a minute, but I don't know where to go. But um, I don't know if anyone had any other questions about raising chickens. Um, it's a great hobby to get into. It's very rewarding. Um, you will eventually have names for your chicks, for your chickens, um, and sharing the eggs with neighbors is great. Um, thanks, Tom. Glad you enjoyed it. Um, yeah, if anyone else has any other questions, um, feel free to send me an email, um, education at mastarofarm.org. Um, I'm going to follow up later on today, probably tonight, with the email, uh, the video link for you to watch this if you have to go back or anything. And I'll also include a list of some uh, resources for you as well. Um, so with that, I think we'll finish up. Uh, but thank you so much for joining me today, everyone. Really appreciate it. And uh, keep an eye. We'll have more workshops uh, in the future. All right. Thanks, everyone.